Let's begin the word with prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you, but also to receive from you today. We've come to be in your presence. We've come to receive truth and revelation. And I thank you, Father God, as your word says, we shall know the truth, and truth will bring freedom, will set us free. So right now, I boldly ask that at the end of this meeting, wherever they are at, if they're watching online, if they're sitting here, at the end of this service, let not one person have any level of addiction in any area of their life, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, not in any area. We decree the truth and the power of your word. You have come to set them free today. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Once again, God bless you. God bless you. Glad to have each and every one of you worship the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn to Habakkuk. It's an interesting place in the Old Testament, but it's a key verse that we've been doing on this series, Indomitable. Say Indomitable. Indomitable. We are closing this series out, if the Lord willing, and moving into a new series next week as we prepare for, can you believe Easter's a month away? Time is moving fast. I'm ready for the warm weather. Say amen to that. Habakkuk chapter 3, if you don't have your Bible, you can look at the screen. It says, the Lord is your strength, your source of courage. The Lord is your strength. Say, God is my strength. Say, God is my strength. The Lord is your strength, your source of courage, your invincible army. He has made your feet steady and sure like hinds feet and makes you walk forward with spiritual confidence. Walk forward with spiritual confidence. Say, I'm moving today. I'm walking today. Forward with confidence. When the enemy tries to attack, he will try to get you to shut down quiet down or step back. The opposition, the pressure of the moment typically wants you to just wish you had done nothing to rock the boat. Can't I go back to a safe place, safe space, and just be quiet and get through the journey? The devil's attempt is to talk you out of making a difference in anybody's life, your life or the lives of those you come in contact with. It's easier to sit quietly by and let people be what, and do what they want to do and not make a change, not step out, not speak out, not stand out, not do something or live some way in a manner that glorifies God and and empowers you to be a witness to those you come in contact with. But Jesus told us that you are not called to be a candle lit that is hidden. Amen. God wants you to, to be a, a light that can be seen. Jesus said that, no, you take the candle that, is, that, is on, that has fire, that has flame, that has light, and you put it up on a stand so it benefits. Say benefit. benefit. Come on, I'm going to work you today. Say Benefit. benefit. So it benefits everybody in the room. See, you're called not just to be a consumer. You're there to produce something to be a benefit for somebody else. Amen. Amen. A lot of times, even in the church world, we'll get confused and misunderstand the point of what God's trying to do. And we'll think well, that God will anoint us for our own accolades. That God will anoint, oh Lord, I need a strong anointing. And many people pray for anointing because they want the approval of others in the church world. Come on. But God doesn't anoint you for your approval. God doesn't anoint you so that you feel warm and fuzzy. God doesn't anoint you just so you look good. God anoints you so you can be a benefit to somebody else. Amen. Oh, I wish I had a stronger anointing. We'll start benefiting more people. Watch what happens. Because the anointing comes out of the time of prayer, comes out of the time of worship, but comes out of the time of you releasing what God's doing in you. That was the key element from God to Abraham, Genesis 12, 2. I'll bless you and make you a blessing. God starts in you, but what he's begun to work in you, he doesn't want it to stop with you. He wants it to be released from you. He wants you to be able to move forward. And if we sit quietly by letting the enemy get all the space and all the place to talk and let the enemy say what he wants to say as we politely buy and say, well, maybe the devil will let me have a turn so that I can help some people. You're fooling yourself. No, no, the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent taketh by force. We have to learn that there's a strong man, the enemy, who's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. And we can't sit by and let him, as we quietly watch him, bring destruction to the lives of people. No, you have to be able to stand up and say, God, use me wherever you want to use me. And in the moment that he wants to use you, step out, speak up, and be the light that he's called you to be. 
It doesn't mean he's called you in full-time ministry. He might be calling you just to make a difference in your neighbor's life. Amen. Make a difference in your employer, employer's life. Make a difference in the people that you know in your world. Amen. But it's living a life that's, I'm not gonna be intimidated by opposition. I'm not gonna be intimidated by opposition. Where God's not giving you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. Anytime someone tries to intimidate you, that's the first uh, red flag that you, re regardless of what they're talking about, if they begin to try to manipulate you with intimidation, know that be the red sign from heaven that you don't have to do it. When someone tries to get you to do something and then tries to manipulate, and if you don't buy into the manip manipulation and they start trying to intimidate you, and you're like, I, I just don't know if I should or shouldn't. Well, the moment they go down that road, relax and rest, they, hey, you're fine. Amen. You're fine. Amen. As Christians, we don't need to be intimidated. Right. God's not giving you a spirit of, of timidity or fear, but of power and love and sound mind. Why? Because we see God is our strength. And when God is your strength, he wants you, having done all, stand, but that doesn't mean hide. Right. That means be ready to make the step of what he asks you to do. Be willing to stand up, speak out, help make a difference. Begin to move forward. Notice this, moving forward with spiritual confidence. Moving forward with spiritual confidence. Moving forward with spiritual confidence. Say, I'm moving forward with confidence that comes from heaven. Let me say that again, because that's not, well, what's spiritual confidence and emotional confidence? No, that's confidence that's coming from God. Say, I'm moving, I'm moving forward. Come on, I'm going to hear you, church. Say, I'm moving forward. I'm moving oh, you guys sound awesome. You know, I love playing chess. I learned it years ago when I was uh, real young how to play it. I love the strategy of chess. Because in chess, if you're going to win, even if you have to, you see the enemy coming to get you, you have to position yourself where it might look like you're backtracking, but you're really moving forward. Yeah. Let them think you're retreating, but you're really moving forward because you, you know what you're trying to do. Amen. God will give you spiritual confidence in the name of Jesus. Amen. Not to be abrasive to people, right. but to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Amen. Moving forward. Say, I'm moving forward, I'm moving forward. with confidence I'm from heaven, heaven. Regardless, regardless of the opposition. See, some people are bold and they're brave and it's just them and there's nobody else trying. No one's talking about them. No one's attacking them. Everything's going their way. In fact, they can, you can live in your room and not talk to anybody and not do anything and be pretty bold and pretty confident. Well, if it was me, all you've done is walk from your bedroom to your kitchen and back. You haven't done anything to make any warrant of any opposition in your life. I mean, come on now. If you like watching sports, we look at there and say, how did they miss that shot? Come on now. It was a layup. Well, you didn't have nobody six foot nine trying to rip it, uh, your head off as they're going up and they're going up and the cameras are on you and the people are cheering or booing and all that pressure. It's just a free throw shot. You've made them every day. Well, when opposition comes, that's where a lot of athletes feel the pressure and they, what we in, in the sports used to call it, I don't know if they call it this anymore, where they would just <coughs> choke. A lot of Christians are <coughs> choking. They pray strong prayers. They talk big talk. They act really brave. And when pressure rises, they... <coughs> I'm strong in the Lord. And your pinky starts turning. Oh, Jesus, I'm dying. Say, I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward. This is not in my notes, but I, I, we're just hanging out. Is that okay? Say, I'm moving forward. I'm moving forward. Boldly, Boldly. With confidence. With that comes from heaven. Comes from regardless regardless of, the opposition. of the opposition. Ooh. Indomitable, actually, in the definition means of a person strong, brave, and impossible to defeat. And impossible to make frightened. Impossible. Key, what, how would your world change 
if the demons in hell knew, you can't try that anymore because that don't intimidate them. That used to scare them. It don't scare them anymore. We can't even forget trying to defeat them. We can't even make them afraid. We can't freak them out. Did you realize that that's available to you through the word of God? Your God is your strength. Say, the Lord is my strength. I want to key in on this word confidence because confidence is a very important thing. It's not walking in, acting arrogant, but the confidence that you are in the will of God, regardless of the situation. Though things might not look perfect around you, like we said last week, your situation does not have to determine your destination. You might feel like you're in a pit today, but you're moving toward the palace. And there's a reason confidence is important because we see through the Bible that we inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. Hebrews 6.12. And so in the process of patience, that's a journey. We have to have confidence to keep going. Too many people stop in the journey. We see that played out, if you would, and challenge everything I say with the word of God. We see that played out by a parable that Jesus said is the, is the key parable to understand all other parables. And it's Matthew 13, we find the parable of the sower. And he talked about the sower sowing the seed, representing later we find the interpretation, and that the sower sowing the word. And some went onto hard ground, and the birds caught it, ate it. Some went on stony ground and began to grow, but because there was no depth, the heat of the sun destroyed them, they withered up and died. Some hit the ground and began to grow and they had a good root system, but as they began to produce fruit, thorns would surround them and choke them. And they stopped producing fruit. And then there's still others, praise God for the others. There's always, there is always hope. Because Jesus said, but some received the word and produced 160 and 30 fold. What are those things? Those are the the enemy's tactics to keep you from reaching the destination. It's the tactics, the enemy, because listen, my friend, if he could stop you, he would have stopped you before you started. Did you hear me? If the devil could kill you, he would have already killed you. If the devil could have killed you, he would have done it already. So when he says, I'm going to kill you, you say, you, would have, you should have done that a long time ago. You've done missed your time. You've done missed your opportunity. It's over. You're not going to kill me, so just shut up. Yeah, right, right. Oh, Jesus, my pinky hurts. You're not dying. You smash your finger in the door. You'll be fine. But if the devil could have stopped you, he would have stopped you. Only God finishes before he starts. In fact, the Bible says God sees the end from the beginning. He literally, before he started you, he completed you. You're complete in him. Did you realize that? So before you knew him, he already knew you and completed you before you began the journey. So in the, when you began the journey, you're thinking, oh, wait a minute. Is he going to quit on me? He won't quit on you. He, if you let him, he'll complete the work. So there's some say that we have in this journey. Some say if we quit, he stops. But if we keep moving forward, so I'm going to keep moving forward. And to keep moving forward, we need confidence. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35. Cast not away, King James translation, cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Don't throw away your confidence. You need confidence because it has a great Recompense or great payday, a great reward. What is the reward? The fulfillment of the promise. There's a great reward. Don't throw away your confidence, child of God. Even when the winds are blowing against you, even when they're talking about you, even when it looks unlikely, even if it smells and looks impossible, Martha, roll away the stone because life is coming to where there was death. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Why? Because if I stop, 
If I lose my confidence, what do I do? I go back. I go back. I go back to where I came from. I go back into the, the lifestyle that God delivered me from. What did Israel say? Let's go back. God delivered. 400 years they prayed. And God answers the prayer and destroys slavery, destroys their enemy, provides them. Every one of them was supernaturally healed because the Bible says there was not one, not one, not one feeble amongst them. The Bible says that, that they were to ask Egypt for the gold who had all the wealth of the world and they gave it to him. So they walked out of that place not only being paid, being back paid. Come on somebody. Overtime paid. They got everything that belonged to them. They were healed. Their shoes didn't run out. They were, God was providing for them and they still had the audacity of saying we should go back. There can always be a demon in the group. Always could be someone in the group that just doesn't believe, that talks. The, mm. yep. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Today I want to close with three things to keep your confidence. If you're taking notes, three things to keep your confidence. Three things to keep your confidence. Understanding the context of Matthew 13. Number one comes out of Habakkuk chapter 2. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that he may run that reads it. Write the vision. Say, write the vision. If you look at the original Hebrew of that, it's actually, you can say, write the vision. Another word is write the revelation. Write the revelation. Businesses use this all the time, and it's a good principle of writing the vision down, setting the goal of the organization so people can see it, so they know what they're part of, and they all can work together. But it goes a little farther because there's a spiritual context. It's saying write down what God reveals to you. Yes. Write down what's revealed to you. Write down what's revealed to you. Why? Because you need to be reminded. You need on the journey, on the destination, you have to be reminded. If you don't know where you're going, any place will do. You need to be reminded, this is good, but this is not where God told us to go. You need to be reminded. Say, I need to be reminded. In Matthew 13, what was the first phase? Those who had the word sent to them, but they didn't have any understanding, and the enemy took it, which means he ate it so they don't remember it. You don't remember things just because it accidentally happens. If you want to remember things accidentally, those typically are the high extreme things, the high great or the high or the very, very bad. You can remember the horrible things that happened to you as a child, but most of you don't remember the average things that happened to you. And when it comes to the seed of God's word, the power is within the context of the seed. So that by appearance, it doesn't mean or look like much. Come on. All right. Oh, let me go deeper here. All right. Jesus referred to it as a mustard seed that is the smallest of all seeds. From the appearance of the natural, it doesn't look like much. Yeah. But within what doesn't look like much is more than enough. Yeah. Why would God do that? It's the system of God. Why would we do that? I think a part of it is because God doesn't want people to apply it without revelation of it. Because eyes, they, Jesus said they have eyes, but they don't perceive. They have ears, but they don't understand. They don't hear. Lest they understand it and receive. The goodness of God, he is so good that casual onlookers have no right. See, God, God it, it, it's like giving, giving dynamite, giving the keys of the car to your 12-year-old. They might be tall enough, but you, you, you know they're not ready for it. How do I know when I get ready for it? Because you're going to have a desire. You're going to press into it. Yeah. That's why the Bible says, draw near out of James. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. What does he do? He reveals to you. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to you. You don't get access, of, you don't get access to it just because you walk by it. You don't get access to it because you came and sat in a church. You get access to it because in your heart you're so hungry, you don't want to miss a word, and you're looking for revelation, and you're like, God, speak to me, and you begin to hear what God's saying to you. 
in any, in any message, in any series, I'll have people, and it's a balance to this, I'll have people come up and say, Pastor, that was right for me. You, you were speaking right to me. That has been such a blessing. And I'll have other people have no idea what was said. Now, if you're a pastor, a preacher, evangelist, a teacher, you have to understand the balance because if you just feed on one, you'll start walking like you own the place. You'll just think you're the best ever. But then you come to the balance of there's people there that heard the same thing and didn't get a thing out of it. To a certain point, you come to the realization as, as ministers, we do the best that we have, but there's a part that you have to play in this. The Bible says that the word of God that went forth did not benefit them because it was not mixed with faith. You have to mix this with faith. Your faith, you have to come in and get hungry for it. You have to say, and I, just this past week, I had somebody post on Facebook. They're like, oh, pastor was preaching. I heard the word within the word. I said, that says it all right there. She heard the word within the word. What? As, I, as the word was going forth, the Holy Spirit was re revealing something else to her. I'm telling you, this place, I'm not saying I'm burning, this place is rich in truth and revelation, but you got to dig for it. Right. You, you have to dig for it, not because it's hidden, it's hidden from the natural eye. You have to walk by, you could sit in there for years and say, I don't get anything. Well, because you're, you're not spiritually discerned, you're working from a carnal mind, and Corinthians says the carnal mind doesn't even see the things of God, that they're a foolishness to them. Right. They can't receive it. You have to pursue it, not just receive it. There's too many Christians wanting to receive everything, but they won't pursue it. one thing. They won't break their routine. They won't break their rhythm. They won't break the, well, this is my, uh, my television night. Every night's been your television night. Elisha became Elisha, not because there wasn't a, a list of people wanting to become prophets. There was, Elijah had, there was a school of prophets. Elisha become Elisha because Elijah walked by and he, Elisha experienced just a little bit of the anointing and said, there's something different here and it's so different that I'm gonna let go of my business. I'm gonna let, I'm gonna burn the bridges that would draw me back. I'm gonna pursue something because I've been pursued by God and he began to pursue Elijah and Elijah would try to get rid of him. What if I do to you? Why don't you just go back? He said, I'm not leaving. Well, I'm gonna go on a short, short trip. I'm coming with you. Why? Because he became so hungry to obtain what God had given Elijah. Yes, yes. To finally Elijah said, listen, uh, what do you want? I'm getting ready to leave. I want twice the anointing on your life. Well, if you see me leave. Oh, wait, I, we could go. Well, I just, you know, I went to church Sunday, didn't get much out of it. Yeah, you weren't, you weren't hungry. You don't deserve to get anything out of it. That's tough. That's tough. But there's, there's no revelation. We need revelation. And revelation doesn't come by the casual onlooker. Teach it, pastor. Just make it plain. Let me help you out. If you don't write anything down a week from now, you won't remember it. We put things on the screen to help you, but not to hinder you. Write it down. I learned that in my own life years ago. The Holy Spirit, the Lord placed on my heart, and I got a book. And I write, every time the Lord gives me a revelation, I write it down. And in seasons of challenge, in seasons of journey that took longer than I expected, I could go back to what was written and the Lord had spoken to me. And I'm saying, wait a minute, I remember when God said that. And when you begin to read what he has revealed to you, when you begin to keep eating the word that's been revealed to you, it gives you strength. It will encourage you. It will bring some life to you. It'll bring you back to that moment when you were like, wow, that was awesome. Do you know people saying, man, I just don't ever experience God. I'm just, you've done forgot what he's done because you didn't write it down. This is practical. Is this helping anybody? This is practical. Get a Bible, write in the margins. Get a notebook, write it down. Get your phone out and go to the notes app, open it up and start typing. Do something so you can put down what God has been revealing to you. If you can't do that, it's not important to you. And if it's not important to you, you'll get no understanding or revelation from it. And if you don't have any revelation, it will never produce life for you. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the Lord answered and said, write the vision. Write what you have seen from heaven. 
write what has been revealed to you and make it plain upon tables. Write it down. Just so, oh, I'll never forget. Sure. You know what? That's, that's elementary attack of the enemy. Are you listening? Yeah. That's grade school. You ever see grade school stuff? You know, sometimes you'll see grade, grade school fights. And you're like, man, the kids. And then you grow up and you see grown ups sometimes doing grade school fights. Yeah. Really? You're mad at so and so because this, really? Some of us, the spiritual fights you're fighting against, oh, the devil's been fighting. It's grade school stuff. Right. Okay, moving on. Number two. Number one is write, write down what was revealed. The second one comes out of Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him, who for the joy that was set before him, who for the joy that was set before him, who for the joy that was set before him, notice the connection here, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We need a point, once we have the revelation, we need to have that point to remind us what God is doing. Right. Who for the joy was set before him. He endured the cross because his focus wasn't on the problem. His focus, though he was enduring it, his focus was on his destination. I am going through something, but I'm not staying here. God has told me his plan and his will, and I have a destination. It's so grand. It's so great. It brings joy to my life. This is practical. Oh, that's Jesus. Well, let's break it down. The Bible says that Jacob had an agreement with his father-in-law. All the animals that come out striped and spotted, I get all the ones that are solid color you get. Sure, what's the odds of that? And Jacob took branches and stripped them and put them by the watering hole. And he would bring the animals to water every day. And when he would do, he would put in front of them these sticks that had the stripes and the spots. Now, I don't know about you, but there is nothing biological there. You can, you can drink water all day in front of stripes and never have a kid that's got stripes. Can I get an amen? amen? But the stripes on the stick was not for the animals. It was to remind Jacob of his agreement that he had, that God had set up for him. God, you had called me. God didn't call him to uh, have, don't, don't misunderstand me, the, the covenant with God wasn't for the, the stripes. The covenant of God was to be blessed. It was a, the revelation that came out of Abraham, I will bless you and your sons. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob knew Abraham was blessed because of the covenant of God. Jacob knew Isaac was blessed because of the covenant of God. Jacob knew he had a right to be blessed because of the covenant of God. And when he stood there on the other side of yet to be seen, the manifestation of the blessing, he stood there every day and I believe he looked at it and said, God, I see the stripes, I see the spots because that's the doorway. You are going to bless me. I'm in covenant with God. Abraham, God said, come out of the tent. Because Abraham said, what is it that you bless me? See, and I go childless. Abraham, come out of the tent. And what did he do? He told him, look at the stars. Count them. That's how your children were going to be. Later, he took them out when it wasn't nighttime. There's no stars. And said, Abraham, it's daytime, but look at the sand. Come on. See the sand? That's how your children are going to be. Why did God do that? Because I believe it was part of the faith walk that he had to keep being reminded of the destination that God had ahead. So when Abraham would be out at night and think, oh God, am I ever going to have a child? Oh God, am I? He could look up to heaven and see the stars and say, according to that, I'm going to have a lot of kids. One day. 
When he'd walk during the day, in the heat of the day, he'd say, oh God, if he got tired or got weary, all of a sudden I believe in them. You know, when you're walking around, even the sand starts annoying you. And he begins to look and say, oh, that's annoying. And look down and say, oh, wait a minute. It got my attention. There's a lot of sand. I'm going to have a lot of kids. We need things in our, practical things in our life that gets our attention to redirect our focus to what God is saying where we're going, not where we've been. The world will tell you what you've come out of. The world will define you by what you've come out of. God says, let me tell you, you have come out of me if you're born again, and i got a destination for you, and I need you to walk this thing out by faith, and it's a process. It's a process. But get a revelation. Write it down, and then begin to set it in a manner where you can be reminded of what God has revealed. Look to your neighbor and say, remind yourself. Remind yourself. Mm. Last but not least, back to Matthew 13. So some seed didn't, were eaten because there's no understanding. Some seed began to produce, but there was no root system because it was shallow. And the heat, the pressure, the opposition. When you face the heat of the opposition, set your focus on what God said. Because the revelation will not only give you direction, it'll give you destination. Third, the seed was planted in ground and it began to produce fruit, but as it began to produce fruit, things came around it to choke what God was already doing it. There's, I'm telling you, not everybody's going to be happy that you're happy. That's why Mark 10 says, when they were talking, to, read the whole chapter of Mark 10, when you find out that Jesus told them, listen, anybody, anybody, anyone who gives to, to me in the gospel will receive a hundredfold in this life with persecution and a life to come, everlasting life. There, there's persecution that will come when God begins to bless you in a, a tremendous way. Why? Because the devil doesn't like you being blessed. There's people that don't like you being blessed. They don't, they don't, they like to feel like, oh, it's all okay that they don't have to be there and they've got it all figured out. And then all of a sudden you start stepping into something. You start stepping into the blessing of heaven. You start stepping into the healing of heaven. You start stepping into the peace of heaven. You start stepping into the joy of the Holy Ghost. You start walking in into levels that you've never been before. And all of a sudden you become a light. And not everybody that's there will like to see the light because some people prefer darkness, John 1. Jesus was the light, but not everybody followed him. Not everybody received him because some people like darkness more than they like light. And you, if you have somebody that you thought for sure, you knew for sure that they were going to be the encouraging one, that they were going to say, great, keep going, that's wonderful, I'm glad you got a raise, and all of a sudden you find out that they're not the one to be that in your life. Don't worry. God will bring another cheerleader in your life. Don't worry about them. You keep doing what God tells you to do. Number one, write it down. Number two, remind yourself of the destination. And number three, Colossians chapter three, verse one and two. If you be risen, then be risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above, which Christ sits on the right hand of God. That means make a priority, seek, pursue the things that God directs you to do. God didn't call you just to pray and sit at home and do nothing. God's called you to make a difference. Amen. Verse 2, set your affection on things above, not things on the earth. Listen to me. Set your sail to the destination. Amen. Set your sail to that destination. You've got a revelation that's going to show you who and what and where. You begin to remind yourself, oh, even though I don't see it all here, just like Abraham, Romans 4, I'm going to be fully persuaded that the God who made the promise is well able to make it happen. Yeah. So what did he do? He kept walking it out. Keep walking it out. And you set your focus, your, you set your priorities to the destination and anything that would try to sidetrack you. Yes. It, listen, it might be acceptable for others and not you. Now, don't misunderstand me. When it comes to convictions, I will never tell you my convictions. I want you to live out convictions that come from you and your time in praying with the Holy Spirit and your time reading the Word. Let the Lord from the Word of God develop convictions within you. Amen. 
Too many people in the church world have no idea what a conviction is. They just think there's a bunch of rules that someone else told them to do, and they're trying to live out somebody else's rules, and they are exhausted and dying. Yep. Looking for an opportunity where no one can see them do what they really want to do. You live out your convictions, and there's nothing, having, I mean, I'm not bashing anybody, but if there's extreme convictions, it doesn't mean that they're extreme uh, spiritual. Paul talks about that. They begin to bring in the law back into the church. And Paul's saying, wait a minute, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You're bringing the law in, trying to earn righteousness instead of receive it by faith. Stay with me. What happens in the church world, and I've, I've experienced this myself, is I used to do stuff to reach the place of righteousness. Come on. God likes me more when I pray more. No, he loves you fully and completely before you knew how to pray. This is hard to swallow sometimes. Because some of us came through backgrounds where we had to jump through so many hoops. And I'm not saying it's okay to live in sin. Paul is very specific in Romans 6, 7, 8. That shall we use our freedom from sin to go back in sin. God forbid. But there's a pendulum to every truth. And you got to find that balance. One of the pendulums is that people have a thing where they think that if I do these things, then I am super spiritual. And they might do the. You can fast every day of every week. And if you do it because it makes you look righteous, then you're really not righteous at all. I believe in fasting. I believe in praying. I believe in giving. I believe in forgiving. I believe in reading the word. But if you read the Bible, so you, you could check mark the box and say, ooh, I've done my deed for the day, and now I am got it good, and I am walking on cloud nine because I did what I'm supposed to do. You're a misunderstanding. You've got to grow through that because the problem is you're trying to do stuff to become what you already were born to be. We don't, we don't pray to become righteous. We pray from the position of, am, am I going too deep? Am I going too deep? Because you're righteous, you're the righteousness of God in Christ by the blood of Jesus. You don't have to, you don't have to prove that to anybody. We got too many people in the world that are insecure, but too many people in the church world that are spiritually insecure, and they do all kinds of stuff just to impress people, to validate that they deserve, come on now. You're righteous, say I'm righteous because of the blood of Jesus. So when I begin to do something, help my neighbor evangelize, invite someone to church, pray, read the Bible, I don't do it to become something I already am. I'm doing it because of I'm already there. And from righteousness, I move forward. From righteousness, I pray. From righteousness, I help. From righteousness, I'm doing it out of love because it's already there. When we learn to do that, we won't be so easily distracted because the problem in Matthew 13 was that the, the thorns that surrounded and choked literally are the things that lure. I like to think of it this way. There's a, a, there's a group, and I'm, I've said this before, there's a group that no matter what is said, they don't get it. They just don't. Spiritually, no revelation. They're not hungered for it. There's no hunger for it. They don't get it. There's another group that get it. And because of the word's sake, there's opposition. And when the word comes alive in you, there's an enemy that gets in front of you. And he puts pressure, opposition, to keep you from moving forward. But if you keep walking this thing out and stay strong in the Lord, you will overcome because victory already belongs to you. Amen. <laughs> Most Christians are at this level. But they don't have to. The next level, once you break through that, you come to this level, the next level above it. See, in my mind, I see boxes. Do you see boxes? They help me out. There's this new level here. In this level, the devil's not trying to get in front of you and push you, hold you back. The devil tries to get behind you and push you forward. This is when you get into things that God never asked you to do. See, in this level, you're praying for a job. In this level, you have four jobs, and you got to pick which one's the right one. On this one, you can't, get, you can't have a break or an opportunity. On this one, the devil begins to create opportunities to sidetrack you. And if you're not careful, ooh, I just, I, I just got a great job opportunity, wonderful. 
but it's going to take me out of, out of the city or out of St. Louis. Okay, that's fine. And it's going to put me in this one city. Okay. And I'm thinking I'm going to take it. Have you prayed about it? Yeah, it's good. It pays well. Do you have a church that you're going to go to out there? Oh, we'll find something. Listen, I don't, I don't know if there's anybody in the room that's dealing with this, but let me help you out. Right there, you've identified you're up for sale. That your spiritual walk with God, is that, is, is that okay for me to say those words? See, if I was really blatant, I would just say, you just hoard yourself out. I didn't say that, though. You just prostituted your spiritual walk. Because all the devil had to do was offer you a better paycheck to get you out of his, the will of God. If you really believe that God is your source and he wants you blessed, you can say, I'm going to stay in the will of God. I'm not getting out of the will of God. And if I have to change jobs, I'll still stay connected to the will of God. Well, pastor, there's churches everywhere. Yeah, a lot of people die and go to hell everywhere too. Just because there's a building and a steeple doesn't mean it's got the truth in it. You better be careful. Guard your heart. For out of it flows the issues of life. If you've been risen with Christ, seek those things. Seek those things. Set your, set your affection. Another word is focus. Set your focus on things above. I appreciate anyone who's disciplined enough to say, I know where I want to go in life, and I'm setting my focus so that I'll not be distracted and begin to say, wait a minute, that's a distraction. That could hinder me. That could hurt me. Find me great athletes that do great. A lot of, if you notice in their training, they set their focus. They set their focus. I'm going to get up early. I'm going to train harder. I'm going to be, I mean, you go through history and see some amazing athletes and they paid a price. What were they doing? Paying the price to set their focus because there's something greater. But many of them weren't taught that the things that come with greatness is also there to distract you. Right. Now you're famous. Now you're rich. Everything should be be wonderful. Hmm. Everything that walks in, every opportunity in front of you, doesn't mean it's a good opportunity. Same way for, for children of God. We are on the journey. I mean, if people can do that for a basketball game, what should we be doing for eternity? Living a life that, oh, I'm just trying to make it or living a life of God. I've come to do your will. I've come to fulfill your will. I've come to live my life. It doesn't mean you're called to be in full-time ministry, but live your life where when you get to heaven, you hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Why? Because you've set your focus. I'm going to serve him regardless of the cost. If they jail me, I'll go to jail. If they kill you, then I'll die. If they... If they talk about me, let them talk about me. But set your focus. Set your focus. Set your focus that nothing will distract you. God, I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to trust you that you are not only reshowing me, you're not only empowering me, but you are going to protect me in all phases. So when I'm walking the journey of life, anything that is not up and from you, God, you said you would uproot it. So before it even comes to be planted in my mind, in my emotion, in my spirit, in my body, in my finances, before I sign the deal, before I start the relationship, before I buy it, before I join with that, before I go down that road, before I walk through the doors. Oh God, by your spirit, show me because at the end of the day, my set, I am setting my focus to obey your will. I've gone, I have gone to places, and this doesn't happen every day. I've gone to places, just restaurants, and I start to walk in, and I get an easiness in my spirit, and I have to, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude. I can't go in there. We're not talking like it's a tavern. We're not talking like it's a, a strip club. Just a restaurant. Why? I don't know. But I don't need to know. Because I'm setting my focus. I'm setting my focus. 
You might not understand that. You might not care. You're a pastor. I'm under grace. Yeah, some people under grace have misunderstood grace and they're on their way to hell because they think anything goes and it doesn't work like that. You have to repent. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, no, I'm speaking to somebody. You, their whole teaching of grace that you don't have to repent. You have to repent when you sin. First John 1, Revelation, Jesus is talking in chapter 3 to the churches and he tells them all to repent on things that they did not and were not doing right. Set your focus. So I'm going to get a revelation. Then I begin to set that revelation so I can be reminded. I'm going to write it down and remind myself. And then I'm going to set my focus that, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. And if I sin, I repent. If I fail, I repent. But I'm going to get back up. I'm not going to quit. Some of us, you got, I mean, this is just life. You got to. Get the dust off you. Sometimes you got to make a phone call. I'm sorry, this is not, this is, it, it, it's not you, it's me. I can't hang out with you anymore. Sorry, I just can't do it. Oh, but they're going to be sad. They might be sad, but I'd rather them be sad and have an opportunity to be healed later than you be sad trying to keep them together and they take you to hell. I'm preaching to somebody. But I've been friends with them a long time. It's time for you to find new friends then. Because some of them, if they take it. If, if you, listen, if you're not the one that can save them and lead, or lead them to Jesus, walk away. Let Jesus send somebody else because you become a hindrance to their eternity. If you love them, you'll want them to get saved. Wow. Say, write it down. Yeah. Write down what God reveals to you. Put it in your life in a routine that you're reminded where you're going. You're not average. You're not, you're not called to be average. You're not called to be like everybody else. You gotta remind yourself what God has said about you. You gotta remind yourself you're called above that. You're called to do great things. You're called to be great in the, in the kingdom of God. You're called to do great things. You're a big time producer in the kingdom of God for the glory of God. I'm speaking that over your life in my own prayer time. You can argue if you want, but I refuse to quit. You are a big time producer. I'm convinced that they'll know who's members of Hope Church because those are the people that are big time producers in the kingdom of God for the glory of God. They're gonna be in the uh, business world. They're gonna be in the political world. They're gonna be in the restaurants. They're gonna be, you won't get away from them. And it's not that they're pressuring people or intimidating people, but there's something about you because of the anointing and the word of God. You have set your focus to do what God wants you to do. Set your affection on things above, not things on the earth. It doesn't mean don't deal with bills or people. It means when it comes to priority, things that change the direction of your ship, let only God be the guide. Not public opinion, not trends. Well, everybody is trending this way. Well, it still might not be from God. Let only God direct your ship. Amen. And you, my friend, you will be indomitable. Yeah. And you will reach your destination. Yeah. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. Come on, give him a praise. It's already done in heaven. You're walking this thing out. I'm serious. I'm not messing with you. One more time. Someone did not give a shout. This is important. This is is so important in your walk with uh, God and the truth that you're receiving. One more time. Next 30 seconds. Give me the, if you believe that you received something today, give me the loudest praise to heaven, to Jesus. Not about men. Come on, praise him. Praise him. Praise them when they're still a giant. Praise them when the tomb is still closed. Praise them when you still see red in the books. Praise them when the doctor's report still sells. Praise them. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Him. Hallelujah. You may be seated. If you're here today and you do not have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm not asking if you know about God. Um, In the way you process, in the way you experience, in the way you understand, do you know for yourself that Jesus, number one, is real, and number two, that He's your personal Lord and Savior? Only you can answer that. I can't answer that for you. God doesn't have grandchildren, He only has children. Every person must come to that 
crossroad. And every person here that's right with God has come to that. But if you're here today and say, I, I don't have any relationship, I don't know him, we've all been there. No one's born again when they're born. But you must be born again, a second birth. It's a spiritual birth. It's a salvation experience. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here and say, Pastor, I do not have a real relationship with Jesus, but I want one. Will he make himself real to me in a way that I know for myself that he's real and my Lord and Savior? My friend, the answer is yes. But you don't know what I've done, the sins and the guilt and the hurt. But he paid that price on the cross of Calvary so that you can be free. Tonight, when you lay your head on your pillow, you can know without any shadow of doubt that you missed your opportunity or you can know that you are saved, your life is forgiven, the weight of sin, the burden, the embarrassment of sin is gone. If you want to know him, let this prayer come out of your heart. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I repent of all my sins. I turn to you today. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came to this earth in the flesh, died on a cross for my sins, was buried for me, and on the third day rose again for me. Because I believe that, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, wash me in your blood, forgive me, cleanse me. Say, Jesus, I open up the door of my heart and life, and I invite you in to be my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Come on, church. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Quick announcements before we close. I'm going to end with a, a blessing that comes out of number six, just to speak that into your life. If, before we do that, let me encourage you. Be open. Many of you are, and I want to thank you for inviting your friends. Every week I'm meeting friends of friends that are coming for the first time. I love it. I love it. Keep inviting people. Keep doing that. Amen. It makes a difference. It makes a difference in people's lives. To see people get saved, minister to too touched. Also, don't forget, following the service, there'll be prayer partners down here at the front. If you need prayer, one-on-one -on -one prayer, we'll be here praying with you and for you. Also, the food pantry will start 15 minutes after the service is over. If you need food or if you know someone who needs food, get in line. Take it for you and for somebody. We want you to be blessed to give. We literally will load you down with a shopping cart based on what's available, but typically a shopping cart full of food, more than you can eat, so that you have enough to take to somebody else. That's just the way we do it. Last but not least, the Lord is just keeps exploding these opportunities for us, and we keep moving forward with them. After the service, we'll ha we have basically, a, I, I'm looking for a better word, but until I get a better word, a better idea from someone, a creative idea, we'll, I'm just call it, we have a, a department store, a clothing department store of brand new clothes, all free, amen that you're available to go and get some for you or a family or friend or whatever. And it, it's always changing and it's of all ages, shoes, coats, dresses, suits, you name it. It's all available. Why? Because we believe in loving people and ministering to the practical need. Amen. Amen. And don't forget even on Sundays during the offering, if you need cash immediately, you're welcome to take cash out of the bucket. That's available. Why do we do that? We believe in loving people and making a difference in the lives of people. Amen. And I, I'm just going to, let me just speak this because I, I think there's, there's a prophetic, spiritual side of this. The Lord dropped this on my heart to say, I want you to, if you're part of this family, I want you to really make sure you get, up, get grounded, get positioned, because as a pastor, I need you. I need you, not just to pray, but I need you in leadership roles to make a difference. I believe God's getting ready to do a positive Explosion! Things are getting ready to explode around here on a positive note. And, you know, I mean, when you get a lot of baby Christians that don't know anything, you need people that have been around to say, let me help. Right. Let me jump in. Right. Now, some of you think I'm just hyping. I don't hype. Amen. We'll wait and see, watch what the Lord will do. But I'm telling you, things are getting ready to explode on a big scale. And, 
And uh, it, it's going to be amazing, but I, I want you a part of it. I want you involved in it. Amen? Amen. All right, let's close with the, the blessing. Raise your hand if you want to receive it. It's called the priestly blessing out of Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone shout. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Proud of you. Have a great day. You're dismissed. See you next week.